don't we bow together for prayer? Father, thank you for your word. We come to this time of teaching now to hear the word of God taught in our culture and in our day. And we want to just settle into your truth and allow you, Father, to have your way among us. So thank you, God, for everyone who's here this morning. And thank you that we once again get to come and be together in your presence. We just seek to be present with the one who is ever present with us. We ask you, Father, to allow your voice to be heard. Um, God, I just pray in Jesus' name that you would help me to be the trumpet today, that you might play your tune through me in the next few minutes. Come and speak, God, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like you to open your Bibles to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, you can open your paper Bible or your electronic Bible or reference this in your head if you've memorized the entire Bible. You can turn to James chapter 3. We're in a series of messages and this is the eighth message from the book of James. We're in chapter 3 and before I read the text this morning I once again want to remind you that I do not have a drone or multiple drones flying around Overland Park or the Kansas City area watching you during the week. So if you're going through some kind of interpersonal conflict uh, you may think that this message was dialed up exactly for you, and the answer was probably that it was, but I planned it eight months ago, and so I'm just making you aware of that, and so this is one of those messages where people gulp and go, I wonder what he knows about me, and, uh, and so I'm just making you aware that that is not the case. Let's go ahead and read, starting in verse 13. Here is what James wrote. He wrote, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done and the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, in quotes, does not come from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. Now, I need to take a moment to kind of examine the context for these remarks as they come right on the heels of what James says about bridling the tongue, which we talked about a week ago. The fact that the tongue has the power to heal and the tongue has the power to destroy. And then he turns around and follows it up with this text. Now, his purpose is clearly to address interpersonal conflict in the early church. I mean, do you think that you've experienced conflict in the church? Those of you that have been attending church for a really long time, well, I can assure you that it is nothing compared to what the early church was up against. I mean, think about it for a moment. The church in Jerusalem at the time of the first century was full of zealots. These were Jews who were committed to the overthrow of the Roman government by violent means. They hated the government of Rome, and that, and that didn't change when they got saved and they started going to church with people who were collaborating with the Roman government, working with the Roman government. So these were people who were collecting taxes for the Romans and supporting them in their disputes against the zealots, maybe even helping the Romans put some of the zealots in jail. And they were all in church together. And so the pressure of the Roman occupation and the oppression of the Roman Empire, the political situation at the time, was so volatile that nothing that you have ever gone through in any church that you have ever attended rises to the level of the interpersonal angst that James was trying to address here in chapter 3. So let me begin with a fundamental principle about handling conflict wisely. In every situation, the issue is not whether we disagree. We will disagree. We'll disagree in our families, in our ministries, in our small groups. We'll even disagree at a church-wide level from time to time. The issue is never whether we disagree. The issue, biblically, is always how we disagree. It's how we disagree. You see, Jesus assumes that there'll be disagreements. That's why he lays down a process for handling disagreements in Matthew chapter 18. The Apostle Paul, he was not upset about the fact that the Corinthians were in conflict when he wrote 1 and 2 Corinthians. He was upset with the way that they were handling the conflict. 
There were divisions among them. They were choosing up sides. They were taking each other to court. They were using secular means to deal with disputes between Christians. I mean, because we're different people in this room with different backgrounds and different temperaments and different ideas about how life should go and how life should be, we're going to disagree from time to time. The fact is, conflict in the church's history has often been used by God to produce greater revelation. It's not always bad. Conflict is often a way the mind of God is revealed. I mean, you look at the history of the church, and conflict has often been used by God to affirm, encourage, and give new revelation to the congregation. That's how all the early creeds were hammered out, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, the Chalcedonian Creed. They all emerged out of or in the midst of great conflict in the church. I mean, this year we're celebrating the 500, I guess we're celebrating the 500th year anniversary of the Reformation with Martin Luther. And uh, I, I, I mean, it's really weird. I mean, I understand the Reformation is a powerful thing, but we celebrate churches splitting in half, right? And so, you know, the church split in half. You know, the primary issue during the Reformation, the primary issue emerged, what came out of that great conflict was something that God wanted to reveal. And so the primary issue is not whether we'll have conflict. The primary issue is all, always how we handle the conflict. Will we handle it wisely? Will we handle it in a God-glorifying way? And so James begins with this question. Who is wise and understanding among you? Who is wise and understanding among you? He says, let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? Well, it's interesting that James uses the word understanding because it's a word that's more literally and translated well-informed. A person who has a wealth of information at their fingertips. We're talking about the Wikipedia person. You know, we hear that, and in our culture, we immediately agree. A wise person is always well-informed. That's what we say in America. They do have a wealth of information at their fingertips, but there's more to it than that, James says. We regularly assume that the wisest among us is the person with the highest IQ or the person with the greatest GPA or the person with the best research skills or the person with the most letters after their name. We assume that they're the wisest people among us. But you've met people with high IQs who aren't very wise. And you've met people with high GPAs who graduated with honors that don't show a lot of wisdom in their everyday life. James says that there are other more telling indicators of, you, of wisdom and understanding. He says two in particular, it's a good life and deeds done in humility. So you need to know that James was a man who was rooted in the Old Testament scriptures, right? He really understood the Old Testament scriptures. So wisdom, according to the Old Testament, especially the book of Proverbs, always starts with an intimate relationship with God. And so a wise person who's someone who has a deep knowledge of God, that's not just cerebral or informational. They don't just know about God. They actually know God. It's not just someone who can spit out the correct answers to certain questions. Wisdom, real wisdom, comes from an intimacy that springs from a personal and intimate relationship with God. There is a reason why the Bible uses the word no as a metaphor or a euphemism for sexual relations. Have you ever wondered about that in the Old Testament, especially in the King James Version, when the Bible says something like this, and Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to a son? It's not because God is embarrassed about sex and chose to cover it up with a code word. He's not embarrassed about it. It's because knowledge always involves a personal relationship and intimacy. So a wise person, according to the Bible, is a person who values relationship and is not just book smart, a book smart information database. Wise people are not just information databases. Now, people are in conflict, and the wise person cares about the relationships. That is their first concern. Their solution will always try to preserve the relationship. Then, here's the second thing. A wise person, G James says, is always a good person. Again, not just a knowledgeable person, but a wise person is always a good person. Verse 13, let them show it by their good life. 
You want to receive counsel in conflict. You go to someone who's living a good life, someone who's modeling peaceful relationships with their family and their children and their co-workers. That's what you're looking for. The characteristic I appreciate here the most is the characteristic of humility, a word that in the, in the original language is better translated meekness. Now, this is not a term that we use a lot in our culture anymore, so allow me to define the word meekness. A wise person is a relational person, James says. A wise person is a good person. But ultimately, James says, a wise person is meek. This is a sharp contrast to what the world says about wisdom right now. You know, we have TV shows about this kind of stuff, you know, things like Shark Tank. You know, we think wisdom is being a shark. So when you're in conflict, the best advice that we're going to get from the world is always about self-assertiveness and aggressiveness and, and braggadocia about not letting anyone push you around. And so the world says that wise people are persistent people and demanding people and attacking people and take no prisoner types of people. They're not doormats. But James says the quality that's most needed and most neglected in the midst of a conflict is meekness. Humility. Can I share with you what meekness is not? Here's the first thing. Meekness in conflict is not natural. It's not natural. It's not something people are born with. It's not the same thing as being an easygoing person or the person with whom folks just naturally get along. Meekness doesn't mean that you're like a golden retriever with a really nice disposition, <laughs> right? This last week, uh, one of our, our corgis that we had for years that my daughter Brittany and her family uh, kept for a long time. His name was Tucker. He, he finally came to the end of his life and passed away. And uh, I loved Tucker, but what we loved about Tucker was he was the opposite of meek, you know? <laughs> like I would say to Tucker when he was a very young puppy, I would say sit, and he would sit, and I would go, now Tucker, I want you to sit and stay there, and he would go, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> which I thought was an attitude problem. So I would go, don't talk back to me. He'd go, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> every time I said something to him, he had something to say in reply. <laughs> you know, I would say to him, sit, he'd go, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> almost like he was saying, you sit. <laughs> Tucker, come here. Wah, 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 wah. You come here. Right? He had this, like, attitude. I loved it about this dog. He just had, you know, Golden Retriever. I, we've had Golden Retrievers, amazing dogs. They just have great personalities. They just love you, you know. You, know. You, you can yell at them, and they lick you, you know. They're just, they're just so sweet. Not this dog. This dog was like an attitude, right? Like constantly talking back. And so meekness is the opposite of Tucker. Say it with me. No, no don't say it with me. Meekness doesn't mean that you're like a golden retriever with a nice disposition. James is commending the quality of meekness to all who are involved in a conflict. So the leaders and the people under them and everyone is to show this quality of meekness. Now, therefore, it cannot possibly be a natural quality because some of us are not naturally cuddly. Okay? We're not all golden retrievers. You see that in the, in the Bible. Moses, he was a fiery man. He actually killed someone in anger when he was young. He understood the way of strength and conquest, assertiveness and pushiness. He was raised in the Egyptian palace. I mean, he was, he was raised among the Egyptians in Pharaoh's court. But later in his life, the Bible tells us that Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. Now, I want to believe that because it says that in the Bible. I do believe it says that Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. But I also have to remember that he's actually the guy who wrote that in that book. <laughs> so it could be a little revisionist history, right? The meekest man on the face of the earth. God had done something in the heart of Moses as he grew. I think Moses had reached a place where he could be described as meek. Meekness is not a natural quality, though. David was a warrior, yet he displayed this quality of meekness about him. The apostle Paul was a radical. I mean, he persecuted the church. He was argumentative, yet by the end of his life, God had taught Paul 
this quality of meekness. So meekness is not natural, and meekness is not weakness. You know, many Christians hear the word meekness, and they think God wants them to roll over and be a human dish rag. They think that God's telling them to be a doormat. But the word meek was often used in the first century to describe horses that have been broken, bridled, and tamed. Powerful animals, strong animals, but animals under control. Meekness is strength under control. Strength restrained. So it's, it's not natural, and it's not weakness. And most of all, Meekness is not self-protective. So a person with the quality of meekness isn't always looking over their shoulder or, or checking to see if someone is talking about them. They don't care what other people are saying. They, they don't engage in self-pity. They don't sit around wondering why no one understands them or why people treat them so badly. A meek person, they see themselves before God as sinners deserving nothing, but because of the grace of God, absolutely precious to God. There's no self-protection or self-preservation in the heart of a meek person. They don't often defend themselves. They know God will protect and defend them. They have confidence in God's overriding control. Pivoting then from a discussion about the spirit of a wise person, James turns his attention to a second question. Starting in verse 14, he addresses the ungodly ways that we often try to handle conflict and the cheap substitutes we often use for wisdom. So here's the question, number two, what are the cheap substitutes for wisdom? What often passes for wisdom in our culture? Look at verse 14, if you harbor self, bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth, such wisdom does not come from heaven but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Now, there's a lot in this verse, and so I'm going to have to try to unpack it for you, give it you as much as I can. You see, James tells us that even in the church, the way people often handle their conflicts, even in the church, is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. He says even in the church, he's talking to Christians here, he says, even in the church, the way people often handle their conflicts is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. He's actually using, if you look at the Greek here, a descending order of wickedness. And so the first word is earthly, which, which means having the thoughts of the world and looking at things from a purely natural perspective. And the second word is unspiritual, which is even worse. It refers to being devoid of the Holy Spirit. So when you're in the thick of a conflict, very often there is no reference to God in your thoughts. You just decide to do things in your own mind without any reference to God or the Holy Spirit or what would glorify God or what might be God's will. Would, would, we, say, would we say this or do what we're doing if Jesus were in the room? Like if Jesus were in the room, would we do what we're doing and would we say what we're saying? These are the questions that aren't being asked often in a conflict. There's a void when it comes to the Holy Spirit. It's like he's not even involved. Ultimately, as we learned last week, I mean, the whole thing can be inspired by the devil. You know, a lot of counsel that you receive in the midst of a conflict, James says it can actually be demonic with no reference to God. Now, I, I don't mean the word God is not used. I mean that the mind of God is not consulted in a lot of our conflicts. So how can you tell if the counsel that you're being given in the midst of a conflict is godly or if the counsel you're being given in the middle of a conflict is demonic? How do you know if you're responding in a godly or an ungodly way? How do you know if the people involved in a conflict are being led by God or being motivated by Satan? Well, James says, you're going to see certain manifestations about them. There are certain things that God never inspires. See, when we see behaviors that we know, we know God, certain behaviors, we know God is not behind these particular behaviors. There are certain things that are always inspired by the devil that are always unspiritual behaviors. And James, by the way, doesn't leave us in the dark. He goes on to tell you what they are. He says, if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about or deny the truth. So we have two marks 
of demonic inspiration in a conflict. Bitter envy and selfish ambition. Bitter envy and selfish ambition. Okay, so the first characteristic is bitter envy. It, it's, better, it's better translated bitter zeal. You might want to write the word down because it's the Greek word zealos. The Greek word zealos, bitter zeal. Zeal is not necessarily a negative thing, right? We, we realize that zeal is not necessarily a negative thing. The Bible tells us that it is appropriate to be zealous as long as you're zealous for the right thing. So it's good to be passionate about stuff. We like passion here in the vineyard, amen? We like passionate people. We like passionate pastors, right? No, 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 no. We love passionate pastors, <laughs> right? We live in a day when people are often apathetic and cynical, when no one gives a rip anymore. I mean, some can hardly motivate themselves to care about the issues, let alone vote in an election. We ought to be zealous for Jesus, passionate to see family members saved and on fire for the spread of the kingdom of God, radical in our desire to get rid of sin in our own lives. Zeal is not necessarily a bad thing, but you want to know what? In the midst of a conflict, if someone is superheated and supercharged, and it's not about saving souls or about getting rid of sin in their own life, when someone is superheated and supercharged about an issue in a group, when they're dialed up to level 10 and they can't settle down, that inspiration is not from God. You see, when a person is furious, blind with passion about their position, over the top indignant over some injustice, demanding their rights, fired up to get to the bottom of something, that's what James is talking about when he's talking about bitter zeal. I mean, if you see someone who's behaving like that, you can bet his or her fury is probably not fueled by the Lord. Now, again, I'm not talking about being zealous for the things of Christ. I'm talking about bitter zeal, being zealous for the wrong thing with the wrong motive, maybe to prove that you're right. You know, the second thing James points out is selfish ambition. Can I speak to you as a 34-year veteran of church wars? I've seen my share of conflict in the 34 years I've been a pastor. It's, I've been the source of problems, especially in my early career, and I've been the object of attacks. And I've been asked to mediate what feels like more than my fair share of relational conflicts and family conflicts and the like. And one of the things that you frequently see at the bottom of ungodly conflict is selfish ambition. So what does James mean by selfish ambition? But I'd like to answer that question with a series of questions that you can ask yourself to determine whether or not what's really bothering you is the result of selfish ambition or godly ambition. So here's the questions that you can ask yourself. Here's the first one. Are you willing to play your position? Are you willing to play your position? You know, in the vineyard, we love to say everybody gets to play. And what we don't often add is this phrase, but not everybody can be the starting quarterback or the star wide receiver, right? We all get to play, but we don't all get to play the position that we want to play. You know, when I see it, a lot of church conflict and group conflict is folks who are unwilling to play their positions. There are some folks who simply cannot follow anyone else. They have to lead. They can't play second fiddle. They can't come under anyone. And if you're one of those people who can't ever submit yourself to anyone else's lead, and you always have to be the leader, I think you should get a chance to try. I think you should try to lead because if you can't follow anyone else or follow their position or their leadership, then you should probably get out and lead on your own because that's always the case. If you can't support someone else's vision, the ideas, your, and your ideas always have to win the day and your positions always have to be heard because you alone are right and you have the cleanest Jesus, that's not godly ambition. It doesn't matter how smart and gifted you are, you'll never find true success in the kingdom of God unless you can learn to carry someone else's bag for a while. And if you can't be faithful with a few things, God is not going to entrust you with more. Can you play your position? Can you support someone else? Can you, husbands and wives, submit to one another out of love? Can you do that? Here's the second question you need to ask yourself to see if you're being motivated by God or by something else. Do you support the whole 
or only your part? You know, there's a lot of conflict arising in the body of Christ over just this question. And there are people who love what they're doing. They love their ministry more than they love the whole kingdom of God. They love their portion of the kingdom of God more than they love the whole church, right? Do you know God loves the whole church and loves the whole kingdom of God? God loves the whole church. He doesn't just love your part of the church. You know, I've seen a lot of ungodly conflict arising from people who are passionate about their areas of ministry. We've had people leave our church over the years, and any church, every church, we have people leaving churches all the time because they get passionate about one particular area of ministry, and the church refuses to dump everything else they're doing and do this one thing that they think is so important. You know, I've seen a lot of ungodly conflict arising from people who are passionate about their areas of ministry, and they begin to believe that what they're doing is the only thing that matters. Do you love the whole? Or do you just love your part in the whole? Here's the third question you can ask yourself. Are you concerned about roles? You know, some of the conflict that churches often fall into has to do with roles. When, when people are denied a certain role in the church, they project themselves into a, into a certain role or their role is suddenly changed. You know, maybe they're asked to step down or make room for another person who's more gifted than they are. I mean, do you know the way that we relate to roles reveals an awful lot about whether what's driving us is godly or selfish ambition? Because God's ambition is not put off by role changes at all. Godly ambition is never put off by role changes. I mean, people who have a call on their life to work with children, they're going to work with children whether they're paid to do it or not. The role is incidental. No one is keeping you from your calling. No one can keep you from serving the Lord if you don't care about roles, money, or who gets the credit. So James gives us a couple of things to look for when we're trying to determine the origin of conflict. Is the person superheated and supercharged? Their agitated state may be the result of bitter zeal. And is the person filled with selfish ambition? Do they refuse to play their position? Do they struggle to submit? Do they focus on their role or their part in the whole? James says all of this comes, James loves process by the way, it all comes from disorder and every evil practice. Now, the word disorder means restlessness and instability. So people who are handling conflict in an ungodly way are restless and unhappy. They're always in motion. They're always in flux. They're always agitated. They're always unstable. They're constantly churning things up. The person who's being energized by the devil is characterized by instability and waffling and inconsistency. They say one thing to one person and another thing to another person and a third thing to a third person. There's this waffling nature about them. They're willing to say whatever they need to say in the moment to whoever they're talking to to further their particular agenda. That's what James means by disorder. I can think of a couple of examples of an evil practice or a counterfeit way that we often deal with conflict and encouragement. These are fairly common, so I'll just mention them briefly. The the first is what a family therapist might call triangulation. Have you heard of triangulation? Triangulation. I'll just run this for you because it's it's just the way I'm going to do this will actually show you what I mean. Uh, Person A has a problem with person B. So person A doesn't talk with person B. Person A never has a conversation with person B because person B is the enemy. So person A talks to person C who listens to person A and offers them comfort. Person A feels relieved. Person C is now upset and involved in a conflict not their own. That's triangulation. You're saying, can you run that again? I don't need to. Because you know what I'm talking about. Because this happens all the time. Person A has a problem with person B. But person A doesn't go and talk to person B. They talk to persons C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P about how evil person B is, right? And then they all go, usually in America, in mass, because basically at our hearts we're cowards. 
we go in mass with 40 people to confront the person that you could have had a one sentence conversation with and probably resolved it that's triangulation i think cowardice is at the heart of triangulation you know instead of speaking directly to the person who's offended you spouses will drag their kids into their disputes mom counsels with one kid dad counsels with another kid they choose up sides Triangulation is a vile practice, incredibly destructive. Here's the second unspiritual approach to handling conflict. I would call it in the church over-spiritualizing. Over-spiritualizing. We wouldn't even be having this conflict if we would just worship together more. I feel like if we would worship and pray together more, all of this conflict would just go away. Well, maybe. Maybe your small group or your family doesn't pray together enough. Maybe they don't worship together enough. Maybe that's why you quarrel so much because you aren't inviting the presence of the Lord into your marriage or your ministry or your small group. And and maybe that's the problem, but maybe it's not. You know, sometimes real issues need to be discussed. You know, sometimes real sin needs to be confessed and owned. You know, the Bible never tells us to worship as a substitute for confession or to pray as a substitute for the acknowledgement of wrongdoing. Over-spiritualizing can be a cheap substitute for the wise handling of conflict. Okay. James concludes by talking about a very different kind of wisdom, a true wisdom, a wisdom that comes from heaven. You guys okay so far? You, you hanging in there? Okay. This is a dense text, and I don't have time to dress it up too much, right? And so I just have to kind of give it to you. Number three, what is true wisdom? What is true wisdom? And so here's what James says. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial, sincere, peacemakers, he says in a summary statement, who sow in peace, reap a harvest of righteousness. This is a glorious verse. Glorious verse. I'm going to read it again. The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace love, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Now, here's the idea. You're in the middle of a conflict, and things are going badly. It's not going well. And so you say to yourself, I I can't handle this. This is too much for me. Things are beginning to unravel in my family and in my small group and in my, my personal relationships at work. We don't seem to be getting anywhere. I don't have a clue how to untie all of the knots in this conflict. Rather than becoming hopeless in that situation, might I suggest to you, that you're exactly where you ought to be. The wisdom that's needed for sorting through something important and something big doesn't come from you. You shouldn't have the answer. See, it's appropriate for you to feel completely at a loss and utterly at the end of your rope from time to time. There are, in fact, seven qualities associated with wisdom that comes from heaven, and all seven are needed to resolve and heal conflict in our daily lives. You don't just look at these seven qualities and say, okay, I think I can do that one. I think I've got what it takes to pull that one off. It doesn't work like that at all. You don't have what it takes. You can't do the seven things that James lists here in your own strength. You can't even hope to be pure all the time, or peace-loving, or considerate, or submissive, or full of mercy and good fruit, or impartial and sincere, unless you come to the end of yourself, because this is wisdom, James says, from above. Wisdom that comes from above. And wisdom that comes from above doesn't come from down here. See how smart I am? (laughs) Wisdom that comes from above doesn't come from down here. It doesn't come from you and it doesn't come from me. So then in desperation, what you're supposed to do in a conflict is go before the Lord offering yourself to him in full submission because you're empty and you need to be filled because you don't have answers and you need answers. See, that's the starting point for handling a conflict wisely because that's when you begin to cry out to God for wisdom from above. It's when you humble yourself. And when you look over the qualities 
and the character traits that are needed to deal with conflict in a godly way. And you say, wow, I don't have any of these. That the Lord says, this is at least what he says to me, good. Now I can do something in this situation and I can glorify my name. You know, the wisdom that's needed when you're in conflict is wisdom from above. It comes from God. It's not your natural intelligence. It doesn't come from our accumulated storehouse of information, from our strategizing or our research or our approach. I mean, when we invite God into the middle of a conflict, he doesn't just offer us solutions. He doesn't simply give us information. He makes us different people. That's how you deal with conflict. He doesn't offer a new idea. He wants a new creation. God allows conflict in your life because he's trying to change you and to make you more like Jesus. Do you understand that? He's forcing... I'm getting a little warm here. Hold on a second. He's forcing you to recognize your... Did I just pull that open like Superman? (laughs) Guys, I want that on the tape. Can you superimpose the us? You you know you can. I know you can, Bob. That just hit me. It's really weird. I need to back up now. <laughs> it just gets me really excited when I think about it. See, our goal in the conflict is, is we always do this, you know, like, like, like here's how I'm wired, guys. Like, I'm like, I'm like hard charging, straight ahead, keep things going, keep things going. But in a conflict, what I do is slow way down. I gather tons of information. I start looking under rocks, and I try to get to the bottom of situations. It's, you know, I just get really detail-oriented, and I try to figure it all out. And what God wants to do is he's like, you don't need more information, and you don't need more research, and you don't need more detail, and you don't need more wise input, and you don't need, you just need to be a different person. You're like, wow. You know, if I were a different person, I wouldn't be in this conflict. (laughs) You know what I mean? If I were just, if I were different, we wouldn't even be having this conflict. So he doesn't offer you new ideas. He offers you transformation. God offers, you know, he allows conflict in our lives because he's trying to change us. He wants to make you more like Jesus. Do you understand that? You see, he's forcing you to recognize your limits. James mentions here seven qualities that characterize wisdom that comes from above. And here's what we need in the midst of a conflict. We don't need an answer or an argument. We need to become a different person. Now, it's amazing how conflict is easily resolved when the people involved in the conflict become different people when these seven qualities are brought to bear. And so James says, okay, here here, here we go. The wisdom that comes from above is first of all pure. So I'm going to show you how I use this verse, all right? So you're in conflict with your spouse or your children or someone here at church or someone in your small group. What do you do? Well, I would recommend you begin by asking God to make you pure or more literally, holy. Hagios is the word that's used here, that God wants to make you holy. So you say to God, God, in the midst of this conflict, whatever happens, use it to make me pure and holy. In other words, here's what you're praying. Change my heart, O oh God. I want to be right with you. I want to remove anything that might separate me from you. Please make me holy. Purify my heart. Now we pray this because a lot of conflict erupts from the fact that we're not right with God. Because we're not right with God, things often go wrong in our relationships. And so we pray, Lord, make me free from every sin. It may not have anything to do with this situation, but I want to get right with you. I want to be forgiven of my sins, and I want to be free from the power of sin over my life. And I see that I've been under the control of Satan. So here's an influence in this area of my life that's not from you. I've been blinded to the truth of certain things. The God of this world has blinded me. I want to get out from under his power. I want to get out from under the tyranny of sin. I want to be pure. Lord, make me pure. And then we pray, Lord, make me a peaceable person, free from the desire to retaliate. Set me free from the desire, God, not just the activity. You see, it's not enough to just be free from the activity 
of being a peacemaker. You need to be free from the, the desire. Let me free from the desire to retaliate. You see, there's so much anger in my heart, you might say to God. Make me a person who doesn't always have to get back at people through talking about them behind their backs and harsh critiques. You know, a, a peaceable person is a person who's peaceful inside. They're not unstable. They're not blown about by the wind. Rather, they're satisfied with God. Their roots go down far enough into God that they're not constantly buffeted about by the world. They know God will protect them, that God will only allow what he wants to allow and always for their good. And so they don't have to strike out in vengeance or constantly defend themselves because that's what a peacemaker does. Here's the third thing. Such a person is also gentle. And I just hit this quickly. Lord, eliminate the harshness from my life. Take the edge off. I don't want to become old and mean. I don't want to be souring in my own juices as I grow older. See, you can use this list in James as a prayer list when you're in the midst of conflict. So if husbands and wives would take this list and meditate on it and ask God for these qualities, we would have virtually no divorce. Divorces. No divorces. If roommates and groups would pray over these things together, there would be so few divisions. Lord, make me gentle. Remove the callousness and the sarcasm. Tame my biting tongue and my argumentativeness and my vindictiveness. James goes on and, and he says a wise person is also submissive which, by the way, literally means open to reason here as it's used in the text, open to reason. And so we pray, Lord, make me teachable. Help me to see that my view is not the only view, that my rights are not the only rights, that my thoughts are not the only thoughts, that my perspectives are not the only perspectives. Allow people to get through to me. That's a really good thing to pray. A teachable person is ready to learn. You can get through to them. They aren't stuck in their viewpoints. And then James says that there were to be full of mercy. Now the question is, what do you do to someone or with someone who's hurt you when you have the power? When you have the power. When these people who have hurt you are under your power, what do you do? Do you crush them or do you show them mercy? You know, when God has us in his hand and we've offended him, he devises ways to let us go. He doesn't squish us like a bug. Lord, make me like you. Make me full of mercy. And then last of all, James says that a wise person is impartial and sincere. Literally, it reads, without uncertainty or insincerity. The word impartial literally means to be single-minded. So we pray, tie the various threads of my heart together, God, to want to serve you above everything else. Make me single-minded. Untie or unite my heart. When we're in conflict... Your heart is often divided. Oh, Lord, I want to handle this, but I also want to squish this person. I want to lash out. I want to retaliate. How many of you know that in the midst of a conflict that your fleshly mind can think of 7,000 bad things to say back to this person? How many of you know that? It's like our minds are factories of perfect retorts. Our minds are factories of things that would just put them in their place right? But what we pray is, in the midst of conflict, God, I don't want to retaliate. I'm conflicted about the conflict. Part of me wants to retaliate, but part of me knows that's not the way to go. Give me the grace not to do it. You know, these last qualities that James is commending to us are qualities associated with the united heart, where your heart is not filled with darkness and light at the same time, anger and mercy at the same time. And so we pray, oh Lord, unite my heart, make me sincere, make me whole, make me free from hypocrisy. So do you want a solution for conflict in your life? It starts with you. It starts with a change of your heart. And so you pray this list and you ask God for this stuff to be evident inside of you because when these qualities are present, it changes everything. And so James writes these final words, peacemakers who sow in peace 
reap a harvest of righteousness. You can be a peacemaker. Now, I hope you haven't heard in this message that, I, that weakness as a definition of peacemaking today. I hope you haven't heard that. I hope you haven't heard me can encourage you to confess sins that you haven't committed. You know, some people are prone to do that. Some people are like that. You, you should not confess sins you haven't committed. We take responsibility for what's not our fault all the time. I mean, if you live with an alcoholic long enough, they'll try to persuade you to take responsibility for their drinking habit. You know what I'm talking about? You're the reason I drink. You're the reason I do what I do. You're the reason I am the way I am. And in the body of Christ, there are people who function like alcoholics all the time. They blame you for their sins. It's your fault that they gossip about you. It's your fault that they sow dissension into the body of Christ. You're the reason that they're so hateful. If you aren't doing what you're doing, then they wouldn't be doing what they're doing. Now, I've had people over the years who've tried to hold me accountable for their sins or for the sins another pastor has committed against them all the time. I hope you haven't heard me say today that you need to confess sins you've never committed. I hope you haven't heard me say today that you need to be a person who opts for peace at any price, that you just have to give ground and appease and make nice with people and give in to their demands. No, here's what you should have heard me say. In the midst of conflict, you need wisdom from above. And that wisdom is going to primarily show you that God has allowed this conflict to grow you up and to put qualities in you that you desperately need, things that you probably couldn't learn any other way. So God wants to bring you to the end of yourself because he wants to transform you. And you say, well, Mark, you haven't given us a process on how to handle conflict. You didn't give us 10 simple steps to resolve conflict or how to conduct a win-win confrontation. You, you, you didn't do any of that. You're right, I, I didn't do any of that. The truth is, it doesn't take a brain surgeon or wisdom from above to talk to a person who's offended you. All you need to do is obey the scriptures. You, you go to the person, you talk to them rather than about them. You affirm them, you tell them what the problem is, why it's a problem, or what you think that should be done about the problem. You listen to them, you acknowledge their feelings, you remediate when necessary, and you come to an agreed upon solution. Anyone can do that, and sometimes it works, even with people who don't know Jesus Christ. But if you really want to change a situation, you have to change the people in the situation. You have to begin with you. Let's pray. We bow before you, Father. Thank you, Father, for your word. We submit ourselves before you now. And we pray in Jesus' name that your word would ring true in our hearts. Come, Holy Spirit. Once again, I want to invite those of you who have never made a commitment to follow Jesus to come and join the family of God. Wisdom is available to you from above. We're not perfect people, but we are people who have a resource that goes beyond anything you could possibly imagine. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. We have a companion and a counselor and someone who can help us navigate these things. So I invite you to come and join God's family. God loves you and he invites you to be a part of it. We're not asking you to join the church. We're not asking you to join Vineyard. We're certainly not asking you to join me or follow me. We're talking about inviting you into the thing that Jesus came to pay for, which is a love relationship with him. You can have a love relationship with God. It starts by submitting yourself to him. So if you're ready to do that and you haven't done that, pray this prayer in your heart as I pray it aloud. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Please forgive me. Come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Now help me to live for you and follow you the rest of my life. In your name I pray. Amen. Hold out your hands before the Lord. I just pray blessing on you now in the name of Jesus. Let's just receive his presence.
Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. As we sing a final song together, I want to encourage you to come for prayer. Prayer team, would you come? Some of us may be in conflict right now, and you might need to pray, oh Lord, I need wisdom from above. Change my heart, oh God. Give me the strength not to retaliate. Give me the grace not to try to work it out by my own wisdom or to try to say the right thing to make it all better. Help me, Father, to just trust in you. If that's you and you're in the midst of something now or a difficult thing, please step out and come to the front for prayer while we sing together. There's also an opportunity here for you to receive communion as well this morning. Take a piece of bread to remember his broken body and dip it in the cup to remember his shed blood. Holy Spirit, just come and just speak to us now. If you need prayer for any reason at all, feel free to come. We're just going to sing one song and we're going to close the service and let you go. Let's sing and worship the Lord as a response to him this morning in Jesus' name.